Number eight, fishing in DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only eight Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders at Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Creek Rods, They'll gain access to our private Facebook group community, be entered in weekly and monthly prize giveaways, and member-specific only content, and so much more. Again, we are only eight Patreon supporters away from this next major milestone. Link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight on this Monday Night Live? Welcome to June 10th here. We are slowly getting into that summertime season, and that means so many things in our area. One of them is just the Potomac River absolutely getting the snot kicked out of it, which is going to be one of the things that we're talking about today, because today is a little bit different. I haven't done this in a while, and I've been promising people that I was going to try this. I got some new software here for a call-in show, and that is what we are going to be doing today is a call-in show. Uh, we got Josh and Evans. What up? We got Justin B fishing. Perfect timing. How is everybody doing tonight? How does my mic sound before we get started here? And we're gonna be trying out some of this new audio. So yep, as I said, uh, we have a really cool show. I've been wanting to do just kind of a riff for a while where I just just talk about some topics and get your opinions and listen to what you guys have to say. And good Lord, did I pick some topics. I put a poll up on my Facebook channel just to see what people were interested in really talking about tonight. And so the topics that we have based on my outlook is the BFL situation on the Potomac River. Um, are BFLs dead in general? Is there too many tournaments on the Potomac? Is the Potomac River overfished? And then also at the end of the show, we have some news on the forward facing sonar data. So a lot of really, really cool topics that I want to get into. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to throw up the old, let me get this here. I'm gonna go throw this up right here. Call in number is 667-307-8583. Again, the call in show number is 667-307-8583 to get going here tonight. Uh, some of the topics that we're gonna be going over again, where is the state of the Potomac River right now? I mean, this time of year in our in our part of the woods, and this is not just the Potomac River. It could be the upper uh, the upper bay if you want to talk about that, or Lake Anna or Smith. But are the places that we fish are they actually overfished? Uh, I know the Potomac right now. There is a tournament. It seems like every freaking weekend right now, which is absolutely insane. And I don't even know how these places have the ability to deal with all the pressure. But honestly. Or maybe I could be wrong. Maybe the pressure isn't as bad as it would seem right now. I mean, when you look at some of these weights that the Costa or the Toyota series came out with Mr. Cat, I think he's going to be on I Can Ellie's show either tonight or next week or something like that. He had a 20-pound bag, three days. Absolutely insane. And that's not something you might necessarily see from a fishery that is completely overwhelmed because of all of the pressure that's on it. So it is fascinating to me when you see a tournament going out every single weekend, how that actually affects. And we got Master McCluskey. Audio is much better. All right, awesome, bud. So yeah, audio sounds good. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So I can stop stalling for time and I can kind of get into the show that I wanted to get into. Cool. So anyway, call a number there. First person to call in is going to win a prize to try to get this ball rolling. I'm going to start venting with my topics on this bad boy. Is there too many tournaments on the river was one of the subjects that was on my post. How do you control that tournament wise? The, the, the post really was, I think it was for kayak fishing. Is there too many kayak tournament trails that are out right now? Honestly, I, I don't know how you would even gauge that. I don't know how you would control that except government interference. And that's my problem with the whole idea is like, oh, there's too many tournament organizations. And it doesn't have to be anything. It could be boat. It could be something else. But the problem when you start saying like, well, should we limit that and how? That's a slippery slope. 
because then who gets to be the only organization? Now we do have a call in number here. So let's try to get this guy into the show right now. All righty here. I'm clicking on the new software. Caller, you are in. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Sweet. What's your name? What do you want to talk about? This is Josh Evans, bro. How you doing? Hey, bud. Awesome. Glad the software works. Good to hear from you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Glad to glad to be able to call in and chat it up. So I loved your I loved your conversation there because I was just talking to, to to Mr. Johnson earlier today about like the boat side of things. And I I mean what what's your vibe on it? Well, I'll tell you, uh, yeah, I, I've been seeing, you know, the numbers and, and there really is a tournament, at least one tournament going out, if not two, every single weekend on the Potomac. And that's on, just on the bass boat side. Um, that That's, you know, I mean, a lot of the fisheries down south, like you're talking about like Tennessee River, Chain, that kind of stuff, they can sustain that. And even then it's hammered. But the Potomac, you know, these last few years has really been coming back, in my opinion, Uh but, you know, I think the combination of the snakehead, fry, and everything else, giving the bass more forage, they've been doing really well. But the problem now is so many tournaments. Um, you, you know, you flip it. And for me, it's the kayaks that, that I, I really look at, you know. And we already have three really great trails here in, in the region with, a, you know, that third one starting this season. And, and or, or we've balanced it out pretty well. Um, but even then, now there's another tournament series that's getting ready to start, supposedly. And it's just crazy to me. It, it, it is, but it's like, what do you... Is this just what happens when we said for so many years, grow the sport, grow the sport, and it's like, well, you know, be careful what you wish for because that's where we're at now. Because what do you do about it? Government intervention? We just cut back? Like, how would... What would limiting tournaments look like, I guess? You know, I don't know, man. I, I mean, uh, from the bass boat side, I, I think, you know, uh, adopting like a CPR format would be super beneficial mm. to the health of the fishery. I know the mortality rates of fish. I know you had what Steve was Chikones on. Yeah. Um, uh, not too long ago, talking about mortality rates in the summer. And, and I concur completely with that. Um, you know, the volume of tournaments going way up over the summer, staying, staying at this high, this high tempo. I don't think it's sustainable for the fishery or healthy for the fishery personally. You know, I'd like to see, I'd like to see, you know, CPR get implemented on the bass boat side during the summertime. Um, I would like to see there be some kind of limit to the number of kayak trails that stand up like the, the you know, nothing against the guy. I don't know the guy, but from what I understand, he's only fished two kayak tournaments and now he wants to start a kayak trail. It's like, bro, like, you know, I don't want to say read the room, but maybe reach out to the other trails and say, Hey, you know, what's already going on in the area and, and contributing to the growth there um, rather than stockpiling on. And one, you know, again, having yet another set of tournaments on, on the river, but also impacting the ability for those trails to, to expand or grow. It's just, it, it's a double-edged sword, really. It, it is. And that's something. So, you know, with, from the Maryland department side, we talked about, uh, cause again, they're, they're all in about catchway release, catch measure release. And then they talked about like, well, fish mortality in the summer is a problem. And then they talked about, well, there's a mortality rate in the spawn time. And it's like, well, you know what Pennsylvania did? They're like, just, you know what? We just don't want you to fish the spawn, but we'll give you the summer. And they're like, fine. And now they're like, you know what? It's a little too hot out. And then before you know it, half the year, they're like, you can't fish. And, and I guess I get nervous with, is this going to be just we try to regulate this ourselves? Or do we need to have, you know, Big Brother come in and say, like, you need to buy a permit and you can only have so many permits. And that's where I don't, yeah. I don't know the answer, honestly. Yeah, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I don't want to say necessarily a big brother. The government has to get involved. But I do think that, I don't know, man. I, I feel like tournament, the tournament uh, organizations should really work m more cohesively together to kind of figure out a Agreed. schedule that that doesn't hammer the, the fishery so often or, you know, uh, gives it a break. I mean, you know, fi fish don't have a chance to reset. You know, they're they're constantly getting relocated. Uh, it, it's just, it's a constant, you know, the stress alone, the stress levels of moving those fish as far as some of them move is crazy, especially when the temperatures get to what they get to in the summer. Yeah. You know, there's gotta be something. I, I agree with that. And something else that I, I, that I mentioned before is this idea that we have as tournament organizers where it has to be a certain size body of water. And if you're going to say just an example for your organization, it has to be over 60,000 acres. Well, if that's the case, then 
of course, we're going to limit ourselves. And then we're all going to fish the same body of water. If people would take advantage of Deep Creek right. Lake, Lake Anna, Conowingo, I'm not saying for every tournament, but just at least one, it would alleviate the pressure uh, because it's just ridiculous that everyone does pile on the Potomac. But again, if your mindset is it can only be a certain size, it's a problem because look at look at like Ohio, like their, their lakes are the size of a damn pond. I know Indian Lake is like 3,000 acres and they have 200 boat tournaments. It sucks. I am not saying like that'll be the best fishing, but if you have a five tournament schedule, instead of having maybe all of your events on the Potomac, put one just somewhere else. It sucks, but it does help alleviate that pressure. I agree completely with that. I mean, you know, the, the three of the three tag tournament series that are out there now, uh, you know, the, the, the primary ones, at least mid Atlantic kayak bass, bass fishing, North Virginia kayak bass anglers and Chesapeake real masters. You know, we all rotate bodies of water. We own MKBF and, and, and MVKBA. They only hit the Potomac once a year. CRM, they rotate between the upper Bay and, and the Potomac. So, so, you know, on the kayak side, we got that down. I, w I would like to see, and I, and I understand series dedicated to Potomac or to that particular body of water, but them finding some kind of, you know, again, other body of water that's, uh, you know, a similar or, or, or that would, that would still accommodate their number of anglers to allow it to reset would be great. I mean, one of the things that I thought was crazy. So I, I was fishing when we did our opener down there in April, um, on day one of the launch, we had two clubs that weren't even from the DMV. Like we had, it was, it was like, yeah. uh, they, they were way out of state and they were, they were holding their events on the Potomac. And I was like, good Lord. Like, you know what I mean? It, it, we have enough pressure locally as it is, but now we have organizations coming from other states that are applying additional pressure. You know, that, that's a part where, where maybe the, the government big brother aspects saying, Hey, you know, we already have X number of tournaments or X number of permits mm -hmm. in place. Out of state ones might need to take a, a backseat to that. That's well, just my opinion. That is a great piece there because when Pennsylvania outlawed so many tournaments, what happens is Maryland gets dumped on, Virginia gets dumped on. And right. this, this is the slippery slope I talked Absolutely. about where, okay, Pennsylvania says they outlaw tournaments, then Maryland does. Then all of a sudden, all those anglers are going to go to Virginia and it's just a domino effect. And I, I don't, it sucks. It really does. I, I think catchway release will whether you like it or not it's definitely become more of a thing as technology gets better especially the weighing aspect since the measurement one is like down pat but it, it's like what nvkba did which was interesting is like we'll have a, a three lake tournament they're smaller lakes but now we don't have to hit the potomac and in my mind that's something that major league fishing kind of did well in certain aspects is like hit smaller lakes hit small dollars of water that's what's going to have to happen at some point because it's it is it's ridiculous that they look at it it's just the potomac or the upper bay but i mean you guys in your words you hit the conwingo i never even heard of the damn place and again it's because if you're in the zeitgeist of bass fishing unless it's like a potomac it doesn't exist on your radar right well i will tell you uh this year was my first year actually fishing the conwingo and dude it, it is one of my favorite new fisheries it's not new but new to me fisheries in the entire area dude i mean yeah. it is phenomenal and i know some people are going to come in and shut up don't say it <laughs> mm. but the place is pretty pretty badass honestly yeah, um yeah, 100%. and yeah that's it you know the, the thing is is you know these organizations they they've they've got to communicate and they've got to figure out other bodies of water i mean they don't have to but if we're talking the health of the fishery and, and maintaining the, the larger spawning size females that, that really put out the good, the good, you know, gene, so to speak, I, I really think that it's necessary, man. It's also just, and this is my thought is capitalism. If you're an organization and you look at like, uh, the Fredericksburg area, Virginia, there's about four lakes, five lakes in about two minutes of each other that no one fishes boom yeah. you can you could put the market there and you can find little cool sneaky spots like that in maryland in west virginia you know just do something a little bit different and you don't have to go to the potomac 36 times in a row and you will have well, a absolutely market. well you know i'll tell you we we do when we do our delaware event uh we do one delaware event every year uh you know to, to help out with our, our primary sponsor delaware paddle sports and we, we make it so any any pond, lake in Delaware, and granted, they're all pretty much big ponds, right? <laughs> they're not very deep, but again, it's more of a roadrunner style where every everyone that's, you know, within a certain 
geographic area is within bounds, uh, and that really spreads the anglers out and really makes them do their homework and figure out which fishery they want to target, which one has the best potential to perform well at. Um, you know, it, it, it's also better than just a rinse and repeat same body of water over and over and over again, you know, that everybody's going to go set on the same community holes and sit and sit until the tides change, and it's just, you know, I don't know. For me, it provides a lot more variation, and I think it's a little more exciting uh, to to do something with an organization where they travel a little bit um, and, and, you know, winning like angler of the year or something like that. I think it's a bigger accomplishment personally. I, I could go sit and I, I could go fish my honey holes. You know, uh, I, sometimes I wish I had a bass book. Cause I'd go fish my honey holes on the Potomac and I think I'd do pretty good against them guys, <laughs> you know? Mm. Um, but you know, it's, it, it's a matter of, I don't want to just go and sit and, or go fish one particular football field size area, you know, every single tournament that's just crazy to me <laughs> it, it, it you know and, and we'll put, i definitely want to put a i really want to highlight that too and then guys if you want to call in here uh six six seven three oh seven eight five eight three i know we have a couple people in the queue already please guys call on in i'll make sure i get you answered here too an angler of the year is the most prestigious title in fishing period that's at least my opinion is that's the most important thing not yep. just winning tournament and if you do just fish two bodies of water it, i do think it taint is not the right word it it diminishes its value. When you go to a bunch of different places and you actually end up being the angler of the year, it makes it that much more special, 100%. Josh? I, I concur completely, and I think that, you know, I, I know you got to go. Uh, it's good talking with you, brother. Thank you for calling, boss. I really appreciate it. Well, hey, thanks for having me on. I'll see you on soon. Yep, I'll see you out there soon. Dude, there we go. First call down. Yeah, yeah. Couple more people there in the queue. We're gonna be getting up our next caller here as well. We got we got a couple more callers actually lining up here. So again, six six seven three zero seven eight five eight three. What do you think about that? Do you think there's too many kayak organizations? The BFLs. I think they the 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 payouts in those are absolutely atrocious right now. And it I felt like it used to be when I was a kid when the BFL was going on, everyone went to that BFL. And now it feels like some of the best anglers are like we don't even want to go to it. But we got another caller here lined up. Uh let me get him on the docket here. Let's see who this is. Caller, are you there? 80476. Are you there, boss? He is, I can, I can hear him listening to the podcast in the background. So while he gets to his phone, um, yeah, it, it's just interesting when you, when you think of it, that you have so many organizations, you know, stacked on top of each other right now. And I, I don't, I just don't know what the answer is. I don't like the idea of putting legislation in or government interference like that to say like, Hey, listen, we don't have any more tournament organizations. There's a monopoly. That's a little you know, in the long run, capitalism will win out and everything will get there. Call, are you there? Yeah. How you doing, Thomas? Can you hear me, brother? Yep, I can hear you. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, uh, Mr. Evans had some really, really, really good points, man. I've been listening to y'all. And, you know, also, you know, um, Thomas, um, you know, I've been seeing this for years. Um, talking about the out of state tournaments and the permit deal. And of course, you know, the state of Maryland, I think you can look online, you can see, you know, who's got permits for a small state park or, you know, I think, you know, up in the upper bay, you can see how many they expect and this and that and the third. But I, I've been seeing it for years, basically, like, you know, folks aren't happy, then they start another club, then there's another organization that comes. You know, when I first started fishing, you know, I don't late nineties. I mean, basically, you know, it was, you know, Maryland Bass Federation or the Virginia Bass Federation, you know, you had, I guess you would say it's like the TBF now, you know, I think there was English choice back in the day. And I know there's a couple of, you know, other little locals. Um, I think Potomac team has been around for a long time. Um, but now, I mean, anglers just have so many different choices mm -hmm. on the, uh, you know, the events they want to fish. I mean, you got Potomac Kings, you got the Battle Series. I think they've got a secondary little series going on. You got the Cat Trail. They have three or four different areas that they fish. You know, you got the Maryland Bass Federation. You got Nation's Capital. You got the Virginia Chapter Federation. You got Virginia, I think, uh, I think it's Region 1 that this, this started this year. So um, there's just a ton 
a ton. And that's all, like I said, last call I'm saying, that's not including Pennsylvania. That's not including New Jersey. That's not including Delaware. They come to smaller state park um, because their fisheries are closed. You know, because a lot of those guys don't want to do CBR. They say, oh, well, let's go to the Potomac and let's go and do that, you know. And that's what puts so, so, so much, you know, pressure on the river. That's on, that's including the local tournaments, you know, just, you know, guys just want to go out fun fishing. Um, you know, me as a guide, I mean, I'm telling you, it's difficult for me to go out here on a Saturday or even a Friday evening. You know, it was Friday morning because guys are practicing and stuff. I mean, basically, I tell my clients, it's like, you you know, you probably want to have an enjoyable day coming out on, on Wednesday. Um, it, it's just so much pressure out here. Um, and as far as tournaments goes, as far as the quality of tournaments, that's the problem we got. It's, you don't have so many angles in an area. And I think what has happened, um, the fields are just getting diluted more and more and more because there's just so many different fields. I mean, I think I sent a message to Bob Petty via Facebook. I mean, he put his um, schedule up just to, you know, throw it out there. Um, definitely support all our local, you know, tournament stuff. And Bob Petty is a very nice guy I, and runs a great trail. Um, 90% payback. I mean, he's probably one of the best local trails around. Um, but, you know, that tournament, I think, had 70 to 80 boats. And then the BFL had, like, 180 boats. So there was, like, 300-something boats out there. It looked like the Department of the Navy was sitting at High Point near Occoquan. I mean, there must have been 50, 60 boats from High Point all the way to Belmont Bay. I had never seen anything like it. And I had a gentleman from Delaware pull up on me, and it was like, literally, I could have thrown a crapper jig with 50-pound test on the front deck. I mean, he was that close. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it, it's, it's, and we had some choice words, you know what I mean? And, and, you know, Kyle, he was like, I asked him nicely, I was like, dude, which way are you going? You know, because, you know, some guys are just trying to pass through, but he was continuing to cast, like right in front of me. He's like, okay. You know, and then I had to talk to him, and I had to turn to Mr. A hole, and I don't like that, man. But, I mean, that's, that's the deal when you're fishing crowds, man. It's just communication is the biggest thing, man. It's like, hey, you know, I don't want to cast in front of which way you're going. But that's just how it is on the river now, man. There's just so much freaking pressure out here. But um, I don't know, Thomas, I kind of want to switch gears and talk to you about the MLF thing. I think that was one of the big topics that you had, too. Mm -hmm. And this is my, my whole take on, on MLF, man. I mean, I might get shot in the face. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, big-time pro MLF guys. I'm not saying I'm pro or anti. I think it's a trail that can be fixed. I think there's a lot of things that are great. I think there's a lot of things that absolutely suck. Um, one of the biggest things I don't like about the MLF is, and it's been like that, don't get me wrong, um, but you get a lot of guys, they'll fish Smith Mountain Lake, they great sticks, they get first place, they get that big $5,000 golden nugget, and then come to the Potomac River, they're not there. The second one on the Potomac, they're not there. Go to Kerr, they're not there. So the guys that want to go to that next level, Go to the regional, which used to be free. There's no thing. It used to be free. Yeah, you know, now I sound like James Watson. Free. James Watson, free, free, free. Everything's free. Well, it's not free anymore. So now you're paying three hundred dollars for a regional on top of three hundred dollars for a two day. And I was it, was it was really interesting before I made the calls, looking at a lot of the data. If you look at 2023, the standards for 2023, I think Zach Stupel won eight thousand dollars. He was the angler of the year. Um, but if you look at the fifth place guy, he won $130, mm -hmm. including the regional and including the, including the two day. Mm -hmm. So MLF, how, or any organization for that matter, how can you expect an angle where boats are approaching a hundred thousand dollars with gas is $4 a gallon for non-ethanol, you know, equipment is at an all time high to sustain their sport, to sustain what they're doing throughout the season. And you cut $130, and I did the math behind that, you know, and I think we talked about it sometime earlier. We were talking about, um, you know, the, the entry fees, you know, the yeah. entry fee for the entire regular season is almost $1,300. I think it's like 1245 
including all these fees and stuff. And that was another thing we didn't have on the on the FLW. But anyway, not not to bad the rest of the organization. This is just some of the critiquing points. Um, but these were basically twelve fifty for the entire season. Now you add another three thirty for your two day. You know, then you add another three hundred dollars if you make the regional. So in the end game, um, at the end of the regional, if you don't make the All American. Basically, if you're not clearing over three thousand dollars, I almost say thirty five hundred bucks. You're not. You haven't made a dime. And I looked at it, and it's like you know, you can go all the way down to the top twenty five. I don't think any of those angles made money. It, there might have been one or two that can pretty much say they made money. But it's it's a you know how, how do you make top five, and you only you know got a hundred thirty dollars. There's got to be some type of, you know, structure change to make these anglers pay for the full season. Like you're all in or you're you're not all in. And um, I I think that's the thing, you know, uh, not showing favoritism to particular circuits or anything. I like, I kind of like the way the Steve Camp's doing the elite seventies. You know, they're going to different bodies of water, just like the BFLs, but you're either all in or you're not fishing. And I think that's the, what, what MLF needs to do because it's very difficult for um, uh, entry level grassroots guy to come in and want to go to All American or to, just to get to the regional. And you know you're getting beat by these guys that are fishing one event, maybe two events. Mm-hmm. And you know if you got all these expenses, I mean, I mean not to, to show favoritism to any particular, you know. The term of series, the term of director, anything like that. I mean, fish between teams is sixty dollars to get in between your parts, one hundred twenty a boat. You can fish every one of them for like twelve hundred bucks, and you get to lay in your bed, you know, the same bed, you know, every tournament, and you know, you're, you're fishing your whole water. So, and I, I mean, there's plenty of names, you know, that I mean, you can look online. I mean, these some of these guys have probably won more money at Potomac teams than most guys have been fishing the BFLs for the last 15 years. It's crazy, so, though, right? You know, the, I, I, the, there the, definitely need to be some structure. It, the money yeah, difference is it's crazy. Real crazy. It, it is. It, it is. I didn't mean to cut you off there, but yeah, it, it's crazy. And again, this is what. Yeah. The professional anglers, this is the first, this is like not the first, this might be the last canary in the coal mine when it comes to corporate, when you need to slash different areas of your business to show different profit margins. And when it comes to bass and major league fishing, mm-hmm. they're like, oh crap, uh, D- Dustin Carnell, just the first one that comes to mind. Don't care about him, but with my brand, it's what. So Dustin requires this much money if he wins. Cool. Shit, we don't have it. What do we do? It's like, uh, well, we're going to poach from the BFLs and the Toyotas because we need to make sure we get enough mm-hmm. money for our boys. And guess what? The economy is shit. Spoiler warning. Gas is expensive. And you can tell that they are slapping <laughs> so much money from Toyotas and BFLs, it's insane. And you're mm-hmm. right, the drop-off in price, even when you mentioned Smith Mountain Lake, that Smith Mountain Lake event this year, fantastic turnout. And the payouts still sucked. Like, they really were bad for the mm-hmm. amount of boats that they got. Yeah, it, it was it was not as, as great at all. I mean, I looked at, a, I think it was the Alpha Series that the C Camp runs, and I think I can't, I can't, I might be wrong, but I knew he's a good fisherman, um, Chaz Carrington. And I think Chaz won like ten, eleven thousand dollars $11,000. It's like, man, you'd be lucky to get that in a two day on a BFL, or unless you own a brand new Phoenix, you know? So, like, you know, how, how can the grassroots guy going out there with a, you know, a 2000, you know, 4A1 Ranger or something like that or whatever? go out there and really make money it's very very difficult and i think we talked earlier it's like it's the, it's the roulette table i mean you can go to las vegas you can go to las vegas and you got a 47 percent chance of, of getting your you know doubling your money you only get top 20 percent and you're fighting over the crumbs of that and not to mention the fact too that what we didn't discuss is the membership it used to be 35 bucks it's like like almost 80 now so it's like you multiply that by 180 guys or 200 guys. I wonder where that money's going. 
it, it sucks. It really yeah, so, sucks. And and part of it is the economy and it's inflation. It's the market that we're in. And we have a good question here. Uh, and then Billy, you know, you could just call in too, dude. Like uh, Billy, uh, I am saying quick paying out 40 spots, top five, 15 max. You shouldn't be rewarded that far down the line. I will say you shouldn't be rewarded that far down the line based on how much you're paying. Because I think like the elites and MLF, like you pay down a certain amount, but you're also paying like 6,000 freaking dollars. So yeah, I agree. I agree like with, with what Billy said there in the context of I hated when I did a BFL and I got like a $49 check. It's like, what the hell do you want me to do with this? Just to say that I won a dollar fifty. Like I, I would like the first check that's cut actually means something. Like I do agree with that sentiment a hundred percent. Yeah, and I mean, even even I, I, I mean, I hope somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. But I think even the Toyota series. The, the pay down structure, I think it's like a, a hole for every four or something like that, you know, and, and I think it's even, I think it was like that when it, it, it when it was the FLW tour, I think it was a similar, it wasn't a 20%. I think it was something like 25 or something like that, you know, so it paid down like so far down. So if you got a big check, it's like, man, by the time you pay taxes on this, it's like, dude, what do you got left? <laughs> you know, well, so, and I think um, the you know, big jip here is when it comes to Major League Fishing or Bass, because I'm going to call you out too, Bass, is they don't really care about the little man. Absolutely. They don't care about them. And it is it is like, exactly. you could readjust the organization to where Bass is, and, and Major League Fishing is not taking as much to where the payouts were better. They could do that, but it would hurt their elite, you know, event trail so it is about how they're sapping money from it that creates it that, that's why the cats in certain areas like the cats and the abas pay out better in some regards than than the bfls do yeah absolutely and i mean even i'm i'm be honest with you, even next year man I'm, I'm looking at something like totally different but decent payout structure is i mean you know flw when it came out the, the bfl lost off fishing they are a great avenue for guys that want to go to the next level. And it's one of the as well. Um, but now it's just, I really feel like we're just money makers for, for the, the top guys. And I think, and there's nothing against those guys. Um, I think what the, the problem is, is a lack of marketing on their side because it's like, okay, we're making up for the downfall that they can't get money to support their guys. And, you know, of course it's a business. Um, it's not like we get to vote on schedules. We don't get to vote on rules. I mean, it's, it's they make the rules. Um, it, it, and it's, it does suck. I mean, it does suck. I, you know, it's, um, it's not like TVF where you have a chapter and then you get to vote. BFLs are totally different. It's like, here's the rules, or buy by it. If you don't like it, don't fish. And mm. I mean, that's, sadly, that's kind of, kind of, <laughs> kind of what it's come, come down to. But, um, I, I just can't understand it. But still, I mean, like, it's like you were saying earlier, I mean, Smith Mount Lake, I, I don't remember a BFL that big in a very long time. I mean, almost a two on the boat field. I mean, you got to go to Alabama. You so you see those type of numbers or Florida to see those type of numbers. So there has to be some type of reason. Why we're getting these big numbers? Um, you know, 2018, 2019, I think it was something like 150 to 160. But you know, they get 180 boats back on the Potomac, or, and during their 200 on Smith, it's pretty impressive. You know, it but is. I just don't know why. You know, because this. Is, <laughs> well, I guess you know, part so of it is I, 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 that, the growth in the sport. Like, I mean, again, it's funny. Like we kept talking about the growth in the sport, the growth in the sport, and it's like a monkey's paw. It's like be careful what you wish for. And it also has to do with kayaking too, which brought a lot of people into it. But the, the fact is there probably are more people that now tournament fish when you ca factor in boats and kayaks than ever before. I think that's with, within reason. And now we get to see this issue here. And again, I've said this a thousand times over the three years I've been doing this podcast. Mm -hmm. Whatever's happening in Japan or California is going to happen here. Those lakes are highly pressured with extremely veteran anglers that know how to mm -hmm. deal with pressure. That's what's going to happen to all of our lakes. We have to be savvy. The idea that you can just lock in a bait for a decade and it'll work it's you got to be willing to adapt and that's like with the forward-facing sonar stuff too 
Yeah, I, I'm glad you kind of segue to that because I ain't going to lie to you. I was one of the guys that I hated it. I was like, this is like death to the sport. You know, I mean, I, I wasn't like on Randy Block as a jock. I think he kind of, he got, he, he gets kind of outlandish sometimes. Um, but it, it's a tool like everything else. I mean, once I got it and I saw you, I mean, I've had it for like a month month and a half and it does it cut the learning curve ever so freaking lutely. I mean I seen stuff on Lake Anna Saturday it was like wow I didn't know they even exist. I didn't know what that was. Um and you know I'm out there crop fishing using live minnows and let me mm. tell you something anytime you're using live minnows and you seen crop it just nose up to a bait and you're just shaking it and they just turn around. And I had another one do the same thing. So it's it's nowhere near an end game. People think, oh my God, they're going to see every fish and they're going to catch them. Uh, I beg to differ. And I mean, it made me a believer. And I'm the most skeptical of guys. You know, I'm 47 years old. You know, a lot of these guys are in their 20s and 30s. But yeah, I mean, it's 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 not the end all game for bass fishing. You know, it's you still got to catch them. And it's not as easy what people think, for sure, for sure. <laughs> And, and Chris, I'm really, really, really glad that you're here because we can really talk about this article. And then, guys, again, I'm going to take a couple more callers tonight. Uh, the number is 667-307-8583. Again, if you want to come on, uh, 667-307-8583. Come on, talk about what, whatever you want to talk about. But so there's a couple of articles that were released. I'll save the the interesting information for the absolute end of the episode here, but an interesting article came out was from Bassmaster. We all saw this. I think John Cruz and a bunch of other professionals uh, shared this as well. And so let me get this up here on the screen just for everyone to see here. And it was talking about the fisheries biologist reveals the effects of forward-facing sonar. Uh, and this was dropped June 7th, 2024. This is the stuff that is public knowledge. I will save the other stuff that is not public knowledge yet uh, for the end that I have, but this is by Mike S. Allen. What was really interesting about this article was they, at this point, they don't see it affecting fisheries, but it could. And I thought that was interesting how many times in the article they talked about potentially or maybe. It, it's, it really was mm. them not knowing. Um, I mean, the, the word potentially was used seven times in this article. And for you guys that are home that haven't read a scientific journal before, potentially means they don't know shit they don't know when they say maybe i don't know like that's how they can spin things so that they can like look at a certain way because they know if they say it one way that they'll get yelled at but if you see those words like that it means it's not 100 percent rock solid proof that yes this has affected it and by the end of the article it talks about the survival from catch and release is typically higher than 90 percent and i think that's funny that they mentioned 90 percent because there's a lot of talk about fish mortality when it comes to heat when it comes to the spawn but right there in the article at the bottom there as you can tell they say 90 percent is usually the survival rate for catch and release well if it's 90 percent why are you why are you wanting to ban the spawn because you're saying there's like a 40 percent mortality at the spawn but right here you just said there's a 90 percent like survival rate so i i need a little bit more clarification on your numbers here guys It, when I see stuff like that, I mean, the first thing I think about when I think about mortality rate, I think one of the biggest things is, is dissolved oxygen, of course, and always fish care in these tournaments. I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I don't think, I think the last call we talked about the number of tournaments and, and of course, nobody wants to get Big Brother involved. I mean, my God, they're already in like everything on their life now. <laughs> But you know, I think one of the one of the parks that I remember when I lived in the northern neck of Virginia, like uh, Beaver Dam Swamp Reservoir, um, down in Gloucester, and they wouldn't allow tournaments in August um, because of the mortality rate. Um, you know, is that something that needs to be done? Um, you know, on the more larger scale tournaments, maybe some of the local tournaments. Um, you know, it's yeah. That, that's a that's a big, big, big thing right there, man. I, I mean, one thing I will give credit to when I was fishing the Virginia TVF Region One, 
um, they try to get a lot of this stuff out of the way, excuse me, before uh, late July going into August because it's just so hard on those fish. I mean, you catch a, a lemon early, you know, let's say you don't upgrade a whole bunch. You know, those fish are sitting in your live well for eight hours. And, you know, unless you're running your live well constantly all day, running G-juice, you know, hydrogen peroxide, something, it's really, really hard on those fish, you know, compared to the spawn. You know, you know, usually it's like cooler water. Um, you know, it's just a lot, a lot less stress on those fish. And I don't know, maybe, maybe it's a mental thing too, because we're thinking, hey, these fish are big girls are spawning. You know, but then it's like, do you when you pull a fish off a nest, is it worse than fishing in August? So, yeah, I mean that that's 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 what I like to know to see the data of. Mm -hmm. um, is it worth taking a, a fish off a spawn over maybe losing a single fish in August? You know, those are potential, you know, next generation fish. You take them on a the spawn and they get ate up by a bunch of bluegills. So, you know, that, that's a really, really, really tough one. Um, you know, I'm not, I know Dr. Joe Love is, um, you know, really good at analyzing that data, but that's some, that's some data that, um, I'd like to see is delayed mortality during the summer versus, pulling fish off a of bed in that, you know, April, May um, time frame. That is, uh, yeah, that's, that's some big data I'd like to see for sure. A hundred percent. But um, I, I, I just think if you pull fish off, and I wanna, yeah, I think if you pull those fish off during the spawn, I think that's where she really hurts. I agree. I agree a hundred percent. And I want to get your thoughts on this, on this piece of the article. I'm going to say to everyone, and again, guys, I'm going to take about probably one more phone call here. So six, six, seven, three, Oh, seven, eight, five, eight, three. If you want to get on this, I know that there is a big time for facing sonar proponent, uh, individual listening right now. So it'd be interesting to get his thoughts, but I'm going to read this excerpt from the article. Chris, I want to get your thoughts on it too. So it says in fishery science, we have a term called catchability, which applies to specific fishing equipment. This is defined as the fraction of a fish population captured per unit of fishing effort in commercial fishing. This could be the fraction of a fish population caught per trawl or per gill net set in recreational fishing. It could be the number of fish caught per angling day. Imp improvement in technology can increase catchability. When I saw this, and guys, what you can do is Command F on your laptop. You can do like you, you can word search on the uh, on the article, and it says fishing effort, like per unit of fishing effort. I would love to know, like, what the hell are they talking about when it comes from? Uh, like, I get like if you drag a net, okay, you're gonna have so many fish in the net, but. What if you just had an off day? What if you only threw one bait? Like that is such a, it seems to me a vague unit one way or the other to say. You know, when I hear that, the first thing that comes to my mind is a company uh, located in Canada um, called Omega Protein, which drag nets all over the Chesapeake Bay. And they've got the ultimate in technology. It's called a spotter plane. <laughs> and any time that you can see two to three acres of Menhaden and can give a coordinate, can give the direction in which way they're going and set a net right, right in front of them. And, oh, it's not just Menhaden in there. There's also like a ton of, ton of half of, you know, 30 pound bull redfish. Oh, we didn't see them. They were underneath them. And the state of Virginia does nothing at all. I mean, that's the biggest smack in the face in the world. I and mean, they talk about catch per unit. It's like, and then they want to talk about full face of sonar. Like it's the end all game. And it's, it's really not. I mean, you know, Thomas, I was out there cropping fishing and it's like, you'd be surprised. I'm mean, like I said earlier, I'm losing live bait and I'm watching them nose up to the bait and just turn around on it. And, uh, you know, so you have some fish that are just active that will, They'll, they'll eat. And then you have some that, for whatever reason, they, they won't eat and they're just not catchable. But the one thing I will say, and for, for me, um, if I did not, and I'll, I'll admit it, if I did not have full face and sonar, I don't believe I would be able to catch as many fish for sure because I'm seeing the live, um, side of it, the behavior. Uh, compared to 2D, where I, I don't know, I can't even count how many fish are on there. It looks like a big brush pile. I can't really make out. But, um, 
you know, like I said, I've been using a month. It ain't like I've been using two, three years, or mm. I'm a Gen three, a Gen four, you know, uh, live scope user. Um, yeah, it, it, it's definitely a game changer. It, it adds that element of behavioral, and, and if you're really into fish behavior and you know things of that nature, it's it's really intriguing. I will say that much. It's it's very very uh, interesting. You know, when you throw a jerk bait or you throw a you know, hover minnow, uh, you know, uh, you know, bait of some sort and just see him nose up to it and just turn around the other way and go back down. So it's, yeah, the catchability side of it is, is I think really it's just, man, it just seems like it's based on the, on, on the fish or even the time of day. It's also the fish. It's very interesting. First. You know, I really think it's also based on the fisherman, especially when you have the wording in there, which is like um, in recreational fishing, it could be the number of fish caught per angler. Like it, it, it's so they don't know mm -hmm. what that means when it comes to recreational fishermen. Um, and that also leads to this. I am going to get in a world of trouble for sharing this, but I will show a little sneak peek of this bad boy. here. I'll take the blame. <laughs> no, I'll take so basically there was a there's an there was a uh there was an educational journal that was dropped by the Texas Fishing Game on the effects of forward facing sonar on Texas fisheries. The guy's name uh is I wish really should know this because I was just talking to him via email. Hold on for five Jake. Uh, I'm going to leave his last name out of it, Jake. Jake is going to be coming on the show in June. He's going to talk about his uh, study, but it talks about the effects of forward-facing sonar on Texas fisheries. He did this study over a, a long time. I was going through the PowerPoint presentation. You guys, if you're wondering how I got access to this, because I'm the Maryland Board of the Department of Wildlife Resources, I got access to all this data stuff, and I messaged him because I read through it. Basically, it shows that it's not that big of a leap. When you talk about how forward-facing sonar, is it pillaging our fisheries? Not as bad as you think it is. That blew my mind looking at the data, and we'll be going into it a little bit more in depth with him, but what I think it comes down to it is also, and this is what sucks, it's the skill of the fisherman. And that's what the data really proved, is just because you have forward-facing sonar doesn't mean you automatically catch 25 pounds. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, there's a, there's a, it definitely, you know, shows the learning curve compared to traditional sonar um, or, or even down imaging. Um, it's definitely, I mean, if you spend $10,000 on equipment, but if you don't know how to utilize it, I mean, trust me, believe me, I see, you know, uh, Randy Carpenter all the time on Garland, you know, Garland Guru, and he's always on there. And guys are asking questions, oh, how do I set this up? How come, you know, I get all this stitch? I mean, there's a lot of folks. That are still learning the technology. I mean, you have to, there's no magic settings that you get on that. You have to put time on the water. I can go from the Potomac to Lake Anna and my settings will change. You can fish the same body of water like Lake Anna or Smith Mountain or Kerr, you know, and there's pond on the water. You have to know how to change your settings. So you, I, I think this is my opinion on it. I think a lot of the younger generation, are good at it because they're just good at computers. Uh, they're just in, if you, but you have to, those guys still put their time in. I mean, I'm still learning. You know, I'm on the water. I'm always playing around with it. It's like turning my TVG to medium or low or off or turning my color gain on. It's, it's, it's definitely, um, a, a learning curve involved. Um, you know, and before I, before I get off here, I don't want to hold up the line too much. The other thing I learned, Thomas, was it's not just a full facing thing, but I, of course I have garment. I'm using the uh, perspective mode and I'm not actively targeting a fish on perspective mode. But one thing I will say, it is unbelievable trying to find a grass line. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of bait that I do not see, that I now see. Um, you can see fish like swimming around in the grass. Once they get in the grass, they disappear. So if they're like not in a feeding mood or they don't feel like eating, guess what? It's going to look like they ain't a fish in the water. But if they're coming up above that grass, um, it's not good in the thick grass, but if you're on the outside edges, the clumpy grass, that's usually where I catch my bigger fish anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a difference maker, but... 
Yeah, that skill level. That's the skill level is 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 still going to be key thing because what's going to happen in time, um, everybody's going to have it. I can guarantee you that everybody's going to have it. Um, but you're still going to have to have uh, that skill level and using the data that you see on your going or your lot or your active target or um, the the uh, hummingbird project uh, active target, and then be able to you know, put that on the water. So, yeah, it's it's definitely a skill level still involved, no doubt about it, Thomas. No, 100%. And, and then, guys, again, like, if if there's anything that you want to make sure that we uh, we talk about, please drop a comment or, yeah, g- give a call on the show. I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts here. Um, what, one question we have here that should be interesting just to kind of talk to people, talk to you about is, do you recommend, uh, a, do you recommend a certain size boat on the Potomac around southern MD area? I have an 18 18- foot aluminum crest liner with a 90 horsepower engine i live in western maryland area never been down there so he's trying to fish the lower lower potomac river I'm, title I'm, I'm thinking he's saying yeah yeah you know i <laughs> i always say this you want to pick your days if i had a 17 foot with a 90 if you've never been there before um you coming out of western maryland i'm gonna think you're probably going to launch out of you know small state park which is a great park um, with a small boat until you really feel comfortable, um, I would definitely you know, like come out of Slavens and off of Mad Woman Creek, which is the upper uh, portions of the Mad Woman Creek. Uh, plenty of vegetation, there's plenty of wood, there's grass. Um, you know, if you launch out of small wood, um, you know, you got Marsh Island area, that's a good area. Everybody talks about the fish camp. Uh, around there, that's a great area. You can do a lot of fishing, a lot of fishing, even with that night. And if you, if it's a great calm day, it's no problem. You know, running outside to the river, uh, go to Chickamauxin Creek. I mean, that's another great creek. Um, you know, you know, and eventually once you find, you know, feel real comfortable, you know, hey, you know, maybe you can run across the river to Lacey The main and most important thing I will tell anybody before you go out. I know I feel like that meme on Instagram now. Check your weather. <laughs> you know, don't go out of there, you know, 4 o'clock in the afternoon or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and you're on a, the least of any side. Oh, man, the fish is getting good. Or you're in Quantico, and all of a sudden, you know, there's a tornado warning. And now you got, like, four-foot seas, and you got to cross yeah. the river and get back to to small state park. You know, 17 foot with a 90, yeah, locally, yeah, you're great, you're great. If you launch a lease van, you're great. You know, you run up to Absco and maybe even Quantico, always check your weather, man, and wear your PFDs, please, man. You know, where, where you have your safety gear in, in check, man. That's the most important thing. And, and, and guys, we're going to end this show with something a little bit spicy, probably, unless anybody, I got to actually check to see if we've got some calling people. Oh, we do. We have someone there. This is an interesting question. This will be a whole topic here. Just, it would be a fun mental exercise let me find the comment here it is so it's from jonathan what about uh what about the upper potomac where certain guys fish the same stretches and hammer their spots five days a week so jonathan sounds like he's upset at fishing guides very interesting thought here (laughs) because i guess the point is and just to for people that are listening context is a fishing guide is somebody that goes on the that uses the public body of water to make money off of So that's their livelihood is using the public body of water. And so what you're saying, Jonathan, or just here anywhere else is, should that be allowed? And it, it, it's such a weird thing because we complain about tournaments, but on the same token, it's like, it's a public body of water and they make their living. Like, I I don't know. It's a slippery slope when we start outlawing things. I, I, I'm a very big proponent of like, I'm a libertarian. Like, I just like, just leave me alone. (laughs) It's kind of my vibe. So yeah. Go for it, Chris. And and, and you know, I, I can I can understand um I've heard that type of convo um as far as tournaments and stuff go. Um because you got some guys that don't fish tournaments. I mean, you got some guys that live in Mulberry, Maryland that, you know, they don't fish tournaments and they, they're off, they work Monday through Friday, they want to go on a Saturday and catch a few bass. And, you know, they can't go to the local park because there's two on the boats and they got parked in the third lot and walk what seems like, feels like a half a mile to the boat ramp. You know, I, I get that. I, re- I really do. I think the state of Maryland, what they tried to do too, I think they opened up like, um, it used to be called John and Wilson's back in the day. It, I think it's maybe called Per State Park now. I, I could be wrong. Um, but it's near Mallow's Bay. 
Mm. And I think that alleviated some of the, the you know, tournament pressure so guys can go you know, launch over there and still, you know, get their river access and stuff. And I really hate to say it like this, but it, it's in everything. It's in terminal organizations. It's in the government. It's everywhere. Man, it, it's where the money is. And it's unfortunate. Um, I think we talked about that. Man, that's a whole nother discussion. But, um, you know, just like the Chamber of Commerce, I mean, these organizations, they're going to chase where the money is. Um, you know, whoever has the biggest pockets and the biggest voice, mm. you know, select squeaky wheel. I mean, that, that, that's, those are the ones that's going to get the attention. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that's, that's unfortunate. And as far as guiding, I mean, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm sort of weird because I don't just fish the Potomac. I mean, I fish the Potomac. I fish Lake Anna. I do salt water. I mean, I fish the lower Potomac. I fish the lower Rappahannock. There, Urbana. I mean, I'm like everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, I mean, this, I mean, that's how they make their living. I mean, it's just like, it's like telling, you know, Jerry to cater. Oh, no, dude, you, you can't, you can't crab on the Potomac anymore. You got to crab on the James now. So, I mean, that's how they make their living. And, um, you know, the expenses guys, I mean, not just including myself. I mean, that was uh, all the guys out here, man. I mean, all licenses are super expensive. I mean, the, Schooling is so super expensive. I mean, you know, it's it's a lot. But one thing I will say, um, you know, if I see a tournament going on and there's a platoon of boats, I'm gonna try to go in an area where I know there's not a lot of guys fishing. I mean, my contact at the end of the day, they just want to catch a bunch of fish and be happy. You know, um, you know, I try to stay out of that area, or you know, even if I see a guy that's guiding, I mean, I you know, it happened on Smith Mountain. There's a guy that's told for striper. I wanted to fish this point, and he was coming across it. I knew, hey, he was a, he was a, you know, a guy, and I, I left it alone. You know, that guy's trying to make his his livelihood. So, but yeah, going back to the question, yeah, I, I can definitely understand his pain. Or, um, yeah, I understand that, you know, but um, you know, it's a public body of water, and it's not <laughs> not a whole lot you can do about it. I mean, if I was a, a property owner, I got a dock, and I got four, three, four bass boats, you know. Casting my dog every single day, I mean, ain't nothing I can do about it. I mean, I don't own, I don't own the water. You know, I own the pier, but I don't own the water. So I can't stop it from fishing. Yeah, and then that's the thing is like Jonathan. I think Jonathan's in the chat too. Jonathan says like 100 percent public water. They certainly have the right to do it. Yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, just hop on in here again. The number Jonathan um, is six six seven three zero seven eight five eight three. We have another caller that's ready to go, so I want to make sure I get him in as well. But that's a slippery slope thing. When, when, when Jonathan was talking about like uh you know a guy yeah. like, fishing the same spots, or or Josh Evans talking about like well, there's too many tournament organizations like how are you fixing the problem? Because if you say like, we're going to outlaw tournaments, well, the next thing people will complain about is like, well, there's too many guys, so let's outlaw that. And then before you know it, we're going to be outlawing how many, it never just ends. It always is one more step yeah. that it goes. And I, yeah. I, I a hundred percent understand what you guys are saying. There's a problem. I just, I'm not intelligent enough to fix it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and the other the side of it, too, is we're talking about guys. There's a lot of guys that do a lot of good on, on the river. Um, my buddy, uh, Captain Mike from Apex Predators, mm -hmm. I'm telling you, that dude catches some snakehead, man, and, you know, and, and catfish. And, and if it wasn't for your guys or your, your watermen out here, I mean, I, I love to Fairview Beach a lot. I'm eight minutes from Fairview Beach. And I don't think people realize the amount of blue cats that are on this water. I mean, I'm talking about, I've seen tons. I mean, seriously, tons come out of that water mm -hmm. and they go back every single day. It's just, it's that many, uh, catfish out here. So it's like, you know, there's the guys that there's some guys that do beneficial work. I mean, you got to keep the snakehead numbers in check. Just like you got to keep the, you know, catfish numbers in check, but I you know, agree. My, I mean, I, I, I'm not, a, I'm not out. I mean, I'm still part-time guy. I'm not out there like five days out of the week. And, you know, but, you know, at the same token, man, it's just, you know, it's about respect on the water. You know, if I see a local guy and he's already there, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, pull up on him. You know, yeah. that's, that ain't right, man. And that's just, that's just etiquette. 
Chris, I 100 percent agree, and I'm definitely going to be getting you on the show here for a full episode. Uh, I know we got a couple. Oh, of absolutely, callers. man. We got another couple of callers in the queue that have been waiting, so I want to make sure I get to them. But Chris, thank you so much uh, for for hopping on. I appreciate it. Again, guys, go cre- check it, check him out, uh, Chris Johnson, in your guide service. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. KJ's Outdoor Adventures, man. And I'll tell you, everybody that's listening to you call, please support the channel, man. Fishing the DMV, man. Thomas Aaron's doing a great job. Man, I really appreciate you. Keep doing great work, brother. Thank you, boss. I uh, Have a great night. Talk to you later. Bye. You too, bud. All right. And we got that call there. Just figuring out this new software, guys. No, I mean, that that, that is really interesting there w- with all that's going on. And then we had, we had Justin B. Fishing just talk about this here, which is uh, Louisiana just passed a law that members on a paid charter cannot keep redfish. And that's basically their money fish down there. Uh, and then we got, oh, wait, wait, wait. Collar, you are here on the line, 73234. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Doing good. I uh, I might be your furthest regular listener. I live in New Jersey, but I'm very interested in your area of fishing. I go down to the Potomac at least once or twice a year, and I fish the Upper Bay quite a bit. And they're probably my two favorite places to fish. So I'm outside of the region, but I'm in your region a lot. Um, and I really enjoy the show. I watch pretty much every week. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, you're definitely in our region because, you know, that, the Upper Bay, I mean, that's that's all we have, especially in Jersey when it comes to, I guess, like boat-sized tournament fishing waters, maybe Blue Plains or Blue Haven up there mm-hmm. in Pennsylvania, but that's about it. Yeah, I mean, we really only have two bodies of water that you can run your outboard and have a tournament on in New Jersey, and that's Lake Apacom, that's only like 2,900 acres, and then the Delaware River, plus our seasons close from April 15th to June 15th. So mm-hmm. we're either in Connecticut on Candlewood, which is taking a beating right now, or, you know, down on the Upper Bay or the Potomac pretty much all spring. It, it, it really is this weird effect, domino effect, with what Pennsylvania did, Jersey did, and places like that. We're like, hey, we're going to close down our season. And so you just screw over all the other states around you because you did that. And I, I've mm-hmm. always been interested in another world. If Jersey and Pennsylvania didn't create that legislation to ban tournaments, do does the Potomac and the Upper Bay get as much pressure? I, I would think probably not because in general, people just don't want to commute that far for tournaments. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you like the Upper Bay series, like, like, the Chesters and the Susquehannas and all that stuff, a ton of that field is Jersey guys, especially a lot of the the guys who, who win them all the time. There's a group of guys in South Jersey who, like, run the Upper Bay. And, I mean, you know, guys from Jersey just aren't fishing Jersey waters because, one, there's not that many you're allowed to, period. But, you know, during spring when the fishing is best, you're not really allowed to have tournaments at all. And, I mean, I fish a small club sometimes that does a catch, weigh, and release format in the spring, which I actually love because we get to fish, you know, the lakes around here when they're good and we're not, you know, hurting fish populations. But a majority of the clubs, and especially when you get, you know, bigger size tournaments, the Bass Nation or whatever, uh, you know, just aren't really willing to do that or have the resources to do that. So, you know, we're stuck driving and inevitably putting more pressure on your guys's body of water i'm, I'm sorry about that but <laughs> it, it, it's such a pandora's box because i think at this point maybe i'm a little jaded or pessimistic every state will eventually do this domino effect of outlawing or banning fishing this time of year because apparently not only is it the best time of year to fish you're not allowed on the water so once every state outlaws weigh-in tournaments, the next thing is catchway release. And then everyone will be allowed to fish at that time of year again, unless then they pass new legislation that says like, no, you're just not allowed to fish then. Um, I, I guess that's where we're headed because I could definitely, if Maryland and Virginia said like, hey, listen, we want to either ban out-of-state license plates from fishing here, or we have to stop tournament fishing because we're getting overpressured. 
I they have an argument. Like I can't say I agree with the argument, but they have one when when so many mm -hmm. states are banning it this time of year and it puts so much pressure on these bodies of water. Yeah, and I mean I'm of I mean I hear you say this all the time on the show. I, I'm of the same school of thought as you as like I don't want any oversight over yeah. anything because I think in the end that will cause more harm than good and you know just open up the floodgates for other regulations because you know me being a guy who lives in Jersey who sees this all the time you know there are a ton of lakes across our state that you're you're just not even allowed to fish at all you know that they've sucks. closed it because they use it for water or you know, a lot of it is like water purposes, cause, like, especially we have a lot of reservoirs that feed like the city. So it, it's kind of understandable. They're afraid of like terrorism stuff and stuff like that. So that's why a lot of these reservoirs are closed. But I mean, it really, you know, it drastically limits our options. And, and you wouldn't think it, there's a ton of bass fishermen in New Jersey and a lot of really, really, really good tournament fishermen. Um, and they just have to look elsewhere, whether it's north to Candlewood or south to the Bay of the Potomac. Yeah, and, and the government oversight there, like, and we've talked about that, of course, on the show. Like, the idea of safety, that's always how they manipulate you. It's like, for your safety, you're not allowed to fish here anymore. It's like, mm -hmm. an astronaut can piss and drink in, in his suit, and you're saying in 2024, you're afraid of people poisoning? Like, it doesn't make any sense. And there's some reservoirs where you can use a gas engine, and they still yeah. use it for water. So I, I, I always... I don't believe them when they say the reason is water. Like they want to make sure the water quality is that of like Evian. It's like, no, I, I really think you're just being disingenuous yeah. when you say that. It, it, the one that kills me the most is because there's, there's a ton of this in New Jersey. There's a lot of nine, nine only lakes, which a lot of those are water reservoirs which I, I don't know how you would enforce this. I always say, I feel like they should do like a idle only rule. You know, if they're worried about people mm -hmm. going fast, because if you're pretending that you're worrying about pollution, I mean, I have a brand new four stroke engine that at idle is definitely not doing the amount of damage that Jimmy with his 1982 stroke, uh, nine, nine, he's leaking oil all over the lake. So you can't tell me that that rule is in place to, keep the water clarity because they're doing way more damage than I would, but I'm not allowed to do it. Yeah, and that we have a place down here called Aquan Reservoir, and and that place we had at least two tournaments this year where it took over thirty six pounds to win, and it's a nine unrestricted lake. It's close to three thousand acres, and I thought like let me idle my big boat because you know what would happen if I got on plane, you would sue the living shit out of me or find the living shit out of me, which you should do, and that's how you that's how you completely nix mm -hmm. that issue is if you hear a four stroke on pad, you know who that person is. And you just you just t either ban them or find the living hell out of them, and people won't do it. Yeah, and 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 me and all my buddies who fish locally and a ton of Jersey guys always talk about we wish there was like a, a idle only rule, and I don't know if it's just because you know this is just how things have always been, and you know the bureaucracy of trying to change anything is just impossible. But like even suggesting anything to anybody, yeah they look at you like you're crazy. And it's the idea of wake boats and jet boats, like or jet boats and jet skis. Like that's the thing that no one wants to talk about. It's the, mm -hmm. it's the elephant in the room. The people that buy those wake boats, I, I talked to the guy that runs the Richmond Fishing Expo and the Raleigh Fishing Expo. He sold two wake boats that were over, I think he said $300,000 for two of them. The people that buy those things, they're the lawyers, they're the congressmen, they got some pockets on them. And they don't want to blatantly say, I think, in the rules, hey, listen, you're not allowed on the lake. But if you say it's a 9-9 restriction, it's vague enough and it kind of like checks all the boxes. I, it has to be something like that because it, mm -hmm. it makes no sense. So example is like on Aquan Reservoir, <coughs> for the colleges down there and the high schools, that's where all the rowing teams go. And I shit you not, there's a thousand mm -hmm. rowers on that place 24-7. And I bet you money that's why they put 9-9 nine because nine, they don't want any boat there throwing a ripple that would mess them up. And the colleges have enough money to basically make sure that stays that way. And I don't know how many like rowing teams are up that way, but here they're 
they're a nuisance. Sorry for anyone that, that, that rose that's listening to the show, but it's insane. Yeah, no, I can relate to that. I, I have a small lake, like, you know, 20 minutes from my house about that uh, Princeton University uses uh, for their rowing teams. And it's an electric only lake, but the Princeton University team, you know, they get to run their outboard boats where they, I don't know, they shout at them or do whatever they do with rowing, but they're running up and down the lake all the time, but nobody else is allowed to use anything but the trolling motor. That makes no sense. Why would you do like again? It, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty crazy, it, 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 and like even these watershed lakes that I was talking about before, they all have like patrol boats that zip around and like yell at people for like not following the rules. Like there's one lake I fish all the time where you have to wear your life jacket the entire time, which whatever. But it's electric only. And this guy is zipping around the lake doing 30, 40 miles an hour all day long, yelling at people for not having their life jackets on. And it's an electric only lake. It, it, it's, it's, it's a very odd thing going on. Are you, are you saying like, it's like rules for you, but not for me? Cause that's what, that's what like, Lake Manassas is a, like a, almost a thousand acre lake in Northern Virginia and a, a massive conglomerate bought all the land around it. And once they bought all the land around it, they made it private, put in a big time golf course and they spent, and I, I talked about this a while ago, but they spend 80 to $90,000 per year, making sure people don't get in on that thing. And they did that for a while. That's mm -hmm. stupid. That the amount of money you're spending to keep people off yep. a pretty big lake that you just want to stay scenic when you could put a boat ramp in there and just charge out the ass. That's fine. But at least you could make some revenue yeah. out of it. Like it, people, and this is the other thing I have with, with lakes right now, especially these, these smallish lakes. I think a lot more of them are going to private. When you look at the whole BlackRock thing and people buying up real estate, at some point, lakes are so valuable. They don't want you to put them in, but as soon as you put a body of water somewhere, the land around that thing goes through the roof when it comes to price. I can see a Lake Anna one day becoming completely private. You just need one trust fund kid to get killed on a jet ski, and they're going to say, for your safety, you're only allowed on the lake if you know somebody that owns land or something like that. Boom. It, we're getting to that place, ladies and gentlemen, for these smaller lakes. It will happen. Yeah, and uh, and the other thing you don't need is people from my area keep moving down south to where you're at because it's happening more and more and more. And if uh, they take the ideas from here around there, it's going to happen because in, in the northern part of the state, I'm not kidding when I say probably 70 to 80% of the ponds and lakes are fully private. Mm. That's scary. That's scary because I, I know there's like one guy – he was on like a like Anna chat and, and he was and I think he was from New York was where what his Facebook profile said. And he's talking about like killing all the the SAV and stuff. And and the way he talked about it was so blatant, like you don't understand the culture, like of he wants a swimming pool. He treated it more like a swimming pool than actually, you know, it's a lake. It is not your private swimming pool. And it's that mindset that killed Florida, I think. When you have so many transplants going down to Florida and yep. then they're just dropping pesticide by helicopters and planes down there and they wonder why they're having so many issues. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, and, and we get... That, that's an ongoing issue. My buddy has been like emailing and uh, going to meetings and stuff with, uh, with Fish and Game and, and other resources here because the pesticides and the SAV situation, I, I mean, I've heard you talk about it multiple times. In my opinion, the, the SAVs are the most important thing yeah. to bass fishing. And our lakes get absolutely crushed. Like Lake Apacon, like I'm saying, the only public lake that we can run on and have tournaments and stuff. They get crushed with pesticides. They let homeowners apply for permits, which pretty much any of them can get, and they can spray weeds themselves off their docks. My, my buddy actually had a conversation with mm. a guy who had a bass boat tied to his dock while he was spraying the weeds in front of his dock. And he said, you know, do you realize like the damage you're doing to the lake right here? Like you're mm. a bass fisherman, are you not? And his response was, oh, I'll, I'll just go fish in another part of the lake. I want my dock to be clean. It, it, it's just, it's a weird cognitive disconnect where you can go into, you can buy land 
next to a national forest and then you could cut down all of the trees and stuff on your property because you want it to look a certain way and and it, it's so fascinating to me like the person's uh -huh. mindset there where if you wanted a pool go get a pool if you wanted a clean property get a clean property why would you buy something next to a national forest? and this i grew up in loudon county and loudon county used to be just all pastures and i used to hunt all the time growing up and then all these people from either california places like that because northern virginia is just expensive as hell they buy vineyards they buy all this stuff and they just completely change it because they want it to be like the idea of what the country landscape is they don't actually want the country landscape and it, it's so it's bizarre to me i i can't wrap my brain around that thought process i really can't yeah there's uh there's there's two public hunting areas in my entire county and uh both of them you can walk around for days and not even see a deer so <laughs> wow wow dude well yeah i mean come on down here I'll, I'll show you some fisheries that actually do have some fish in them if you ever are down this way but i really appreciate you calling i'm, I'm sorry yeah. about that situation that really sucks up there in jersey man yeah man i, I mean that's that's why uh that's why at least i come come down as much as i do um because it, it, it's really you know kind of our our only options for you know when you're fishing tournaments and you know i fish bunch of different tournaments, a couple bigger trails and stuff, and you go where they tell you to go, and it's it's always down there. So, and I, and I guess the question to me is, with the size of the lakes that you're usually fishing, and you go to the Potomac, and granted, the Potomac is a great fishery and it's really big, you wouldn't be opposed to smaller fisheries at all. So, if you did do a uh, a Lake Anna, a you know Blue Haven, and um in in Pennsylvania, like places like that, that are a little bit, they're, they're not the size, but you could go fish in that time of year. Yeah. Would you be opposed to that in the schedule? Yeah. I wouldn't be opposed to that. I mean, I, I'm kind of a, a little bit of a, of a different case than most of the guys in Jersey, probably because I did uh, college fishing for four years right and, you know, I've done BFLs, which I know you were talking about that before. I don't do anymore. Um, I've even done like Toyota series and stuff like that. So I've been all over the place fishing a, a bunch of big bodies of water. I personally like to fish the big bodies of water, but you know, if they were throwing small stuff on our schedule, especially stuff that the field hasn't been to before, mm -hmm. like I always love going to new places because I feel, and, and I don't know if this is right or wrong, but I've been to a lot of places before. So I always feel like I have a personal advantage when people when nobody has history on the lake, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm, and I'm a younger guy, you know, so most of these places we're fishing, I'm fishing against guys who've been fishing them for 25, 30, 35, 40 years. So I love going to new places, but I mean, big, small, whatever in between, as, as long as I'm allowed to actually turn my engine on, I, I mean, I'll fish a tournament where, wherever they want to send me. No, right, right on boss. And that's like, that's honestly also the sentiment I get from chat and everything where it's, you will fish local if you're allowed to, cause it's convenient. And then of course you'll go out of state or you'll go to other places. It's just this, it is down to this weird government mandate that you're not allowed to, which really is just a pain in the ass. Because again, with gas prices and just life, we all can't like this is the problem with the 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 kayak trails i know with like uh the hobie trail they had some issues with that texas tournament with with getting draw because not everyone can drive to texas to do it not everyone can go from jersey to virginia mm -hmm. or, or from you know because virginia size northern virginia all the way down to smith every weekend because you have a family it costs money and shit. and but if you're forced to like yeah it, it i don't know this will be interesting at the next Maryland meeting to see if anything about this comes up. But no, dude, I greatly appreciate you coming on the show. Um, guys, well, we're going to definitely be doing more calling call in shows like this now that we got this all beta tested. Uh, dude, I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me on, man. Love the show. Thanks. Talk to you later, bud. All right, Bye. there you got it, guys. That was awesome. Great, great call-in show tonight. We're going to be doing this a lot more now that I got this software caught up here. We got a bunch of questions. I'm probably going to do a square up for all of these questions that we have in chat that I didn't get to. Um, let's get a couple done here. I want to get at least one done. Where'd that one go? 
Uh, it only gets worse once you start adding in more government control to it, 100%. And again, I'm not trying to be all whatever. It's just I, I can see when you start adding more rules what happens. It's a slippery slope. And so do I want to see some things change? Absolutely, I do. And I also don't want to, I want to be a realist and not too much of virtue when it comes to catchway release. I think catchway release for better or worse with the technology, look at chat GPT, look at what's going on with catch photo release tournaments. Like the technology will catch up to where doing catchway release in a single boat tournament will make sense. That's what's scary. And once it's, that's how good the technology will get our kids. If they're fishing tournaments, there will be a lot more catchway release tournaments. I think the Pandora's box here, if you think about this, if you start outlawing way in tournaments because of fish health, okay, because of bringing them into the live well and all that other crap, fine. Okay, but then we create a world where catchway releases the norm. Way in tournaments are a relic. Are then people going to be complaining like, but the mortality rates are still too high. At what point are mortality rates acceptable? Guess what? Yeah, fish will die. That's that's what's going to happen. What is an acceptable rate of fish deaths to where we can still out and go fishing? It sucks that some fish will die, but if the number is absolute zero, that means fishing needs to be outlawed when it comes to catchway release. Just keep that in mind when people start talking about this stuff about fish mortality rates. You know, I think Jonathan said something here about uh, was uh, when you have a particular guide fishing a stretch five days a week and hammering the same holes every day to the point that they almost stop holding fish. Uh, there's something wrong with that. Yeah, but it's it's public water. And here's the thing. Let's say a person does it every day. Those places won't hold fish anymore because fish move. And guess what? That person doesn't catch them anymore. And then you get to catch them because they move somewhere else and then you catch them. That's how fishing works. You know, and that's public water. It sucks. Um, it really does. But you gotta out you gotta outthink the fishermen and you gotta outthink the fish, which is possible. Like the, no spot will hold fish indefinitely. Pressure will move them and they'll go somewhere else. And then you can then time in on that too. You know, that's kind of how fishing works. Um, but guys, I really and then we got one more question here. Clay Jackson, can you explain the Zach Burge drama in the Chandra the ch name why can't i speak english oh my god the chawan chawan i feel like i'm getting close to being racist the way i say that chawan i'm gonna stop that anyway i will do a whole episode on that and i will get somebody else that's also more intelligent than me because i feel like at this time i cannot break this down the whole time but it's MLF being retarded again. That's what they're really good at. But again, guys, thank you so much. This was a fantastic uh, inaugural call-in show. I think it's really worked. Let's start doing these more. Please let me know in the comment section. Do you want me to do more call-in shows for Monday Night Lives? If so, I will make this more of a thing. Like, subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. And also, I know this is really uh, like a little thing, but we are only eight Patreon members away, eight Patreon members away from our next major milestone. I would really appreciate it if you go support the show. Sponsorship dollars are super dry. Y'all know that about the fishing industry. If it wasn't for my Patreon supporters, I could not be doing this show the way I am. I would really appreciate it. We're only eight Patreon members away from our next major, my, major milestone. And again, someday when we hit our big milestone, we're going to start our own nonprofit so we can supplement and stock all of our local fisheries. We will create that nonprofit to help fight for our local waterways so fishermen have a voice. So we will be the NRA for our local waters and our anglers. That is my overall goal and our dream. But before we get there, we just need eight more to get our next step on that journey. Like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.